welcome everybody to Collecting and Cultivating Native Seeds um, with Paul Hayden. Hey, Paul, yay, everyone, a big round of applause for Paul. Um, so this is the second in the DIY seed series presented um, and offered in collaboration with the David Suzuki Foundation. So thanks to David Suzuki Foundation. Um, my name is Ryan Godfrey. Hello, everyone. Um, I am a volunteer with NAMPS, have been for eight years. Um, I'm actively involved in lots of parts of the organization, but especially plant sales. I'm on the plant sale committee and the plant sale committee would like to say that we have news for you and we will be giving that news in just a little bit. Um, but first, I'm going to give a little introduction to the talk, a little land acknowledgement and some housekeeping. And then we'll get into Paul's intro and the talk itself. Um, so first wanted to just remind everybody that um, NAMPS is an organization that's all about the promotion, conservation, and education around native plants and native plant habitats um, in North America, evidently, as our name suggests. Um, and this talk falls so nicely into that. It's gonna give us amazing tools to engage directly with our native plants. We're gonna learn about collecting, storing, and creating the optimal conditions for germinating um, the seeds of native plants. How fascinating, it's something I love to do. Super looking forward to learning more about it from an amazing, amazing native plant cultivator. We'll learn a little bit more about Paul later, but this is, um, yeah, it's it's gonna be great. I'm uh, super, super excited about it. I don't know why it's not going to my headphones. Oh, somebody possibly unmuted. Um, this was part of housekeeping, but I'm gonna say it now. It would be wonderful if everyone could uh, mute themselves, please. There's a lot of folks, 272 people um, on the call right now. Would really appreciate it if you could um, take your video off and, and mute for the duration of the presentation. That would be great. During Q&A, um, I'm open to having people speak their questions if they would like to, uh, but for now, <laughs> uh, we'll leave it to, uh, to mute, please. Uh, okay, um, so the next thing I'm going to read a wonderfully written um, land acknowledgement. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining from Toronto, Canada, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and Wandat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, I also like to acknowledge that our projects at NAMPS from coast to coast to coast are located on the traditional territories of diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations and are mindful of our broken covenants. Mm -hmm. um, by making a land acknowledgement, we're taking part in an act of reconciliation, honoring the land and indigenous heritage, which dates back over 10,000 years. Um, so I really like that land acknowledgement. Um, I think it's well written. I'm actually not sure who wrote it, it wasn't me. Um, but I thought, um, and Ali and I agreed that it would be kind of cool to take just a moment or two here um, to talk about how we are actively engaging in that process that I just mentioned of truth and reconciliation and decolonization, whether that's um, with ourselves, our institutions, with indigenous peoples, communities, or governments, or with the land. Um, and so, so we know that that process is about more than just speaking some words, we're actually doing things, right? I, I hope we are actually doing real things. And um, yeah, I just thought we could take a moment to maybe in the chat, if people have things that they're doing in their life right now to engage with that process actively, um, I'd love to hear it. You could just throw it down there. We could uh, have, have a little moment for that. And while, while that's coming in, I'll say one of the things that I've been doing is engaging with um, independent indigenous media. Um, so I started listening to this podcast called um, Media Indigena recently, pretty cool podcast. Um, and there's also Turtle Island News is another one that I'm, I'm aware of, a newspaper. Um, yeah. Anything else possibly relating to native plants? Okay, so learning some languages and some plant names. A cool idea. I've been doing the same with Anishinaabe names uh, for plants. Um, I don't know. Anyone else? I guess, uh, so henceforth, let's just say, um, if you it's taking you a little moment to think about this, um, we'll reserve the, um, oh, red braiding sweetgrass, Marianne. Cool, cool idea. Um, 
So we'll leave the chat open for any of these ideas um, throughout the talk if they come to you, as well as questions that I'll go through at the end uh, when we get to Q&A. Um, so let's reserve the chat for those two things. Um, okay, with that, I'll go on to housekeeping. So I already talked about muting, um, I talked about questions, um, and then just that we're recording. Everybody knows that we're recording right now and that the recording will be posted um, within the next seven days on the NAMPS website, I believe, Ali, right? NAMPS.org um, is where you'll find that within a week from today. So yeah, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Paul. Hayden started the Indigenous Plant Company in 1998, and his partner changed the name to Grow Wild with that famous exclamation point in uh, 2001, apparently with the permission of Lorraine Johnson. I didn't know that, Paul. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because of Lorraine's amazing book, which if you haven't read it, go read it. Um, they grow at Grow Wild. Uh, over 180 species of trees, shrubs, perennials, grasses, and my favorite, sedges. <laughs> <laughs> Paul has a deep love of nature and enjoys being outdoors. Who doesn't? Um, he received his forest, forestry diploma from Sir F Sanford Fleming and a biology degree from Trent University. Uh, besides working at the nursery, I'm, I'm reading that Paul also works as an ecologist part-time to continue his field of study, amazing. Fantastic, Paul. Well, with that, um, take it away. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. Let's hope this works. All right. There we go. I'm seeing it pop up. Zach? <laughs> no worries. Oops. I'm seeing some more things come in the chat about things that we're doing towards reconciliation. That's great. Keep it up. Keep it up. <laughs> okay. It's up, uh, it's up on my computer. Yeah, I'm seeing it. So just head over to the first slide and then hit presentation mode and we'll be good to go. Okay. Sorry. It's, uh, a little funky. There we go. The get in preview. <laughs> Everyone avert your gaze. <laughs> spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. No. Uh, that's fine. This is good, actually. Yeah, we're getting a little preview. <laughs> okay, is it it's working? Uh, yeah, that appears to be the title slide. Yep. All right. Okay, Take it good. away, Paul. Hi, uh, my name is Paul, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. This is my second Zoom. I've turned down almost all my Zoom meetings because it's so weird not being able to see people. So uh, at least I get to see Ryan tonight. So that, that makes me happy. So let's uh, get into this speech. Um, I'm hoping, um, oh, oh, there we go. My computer's acting a bit funky here with this. Uh, yeah. No worries. It was it came in a little tiny bit choppy, Paul, but just just go for it. Yeah, take it one okay. at a time. All right. So let's talk about what we're going to be talking about tonight. We want to talk about collecting seed, seed viability, seed cleaning, sowing seeds, native plant propagation, building a native plant garden and species the audience would like to propagate. And then we'll have a nice uh, robust discussion and question period. So the first thing we want to do is collect seeds. When we're uh, so basically, you want to collect seeds when the sites are least susceptible to your damage. For example, you know if you're collecting from a peat bog, a lot of the times I'll go out there and collect when the ground's frozen, so I'm not putting my footprints through the peat bog. You also don't want to collect from species that are listed, endangered species. Um, you don't want to collect from private property unless you have permission or parks or anything. What I like to do is collect from hydro corridors private property that I have permission, um, size of roads, uh, things like that. Now, some people aren't gonna know what the plants look like when they're in seed versus when they're in flower. So what you could do is go to your plants that are in flower and put like some flagging tape or some way that you can find those seeds later on. You also wanna wait six, eight, maybe 10 weeks for the seeds to ripen. 
And um, you want to make sure if they're dry, they're firm, plump, and dry. If they're berry, that they're the right color. You know, I'll talk at the end if people want to know some of the books that I, I've read. I haven't discovered anything on my own. Everything's just regurgitated from other people that have done it, like Dur, Kalina. And uh, we can talk a bit about all the uh, great books there is out there if you really want to get into this. So there's, uh, you only want to collect 5 to 10%. And sometimes more people will go to your site. So that's another thing you want to pay attention to. If you come and notice the site's been collected, you don't want to collect too many seeds because you want to leave some for natural regeneration or and, and various other things. The only time I ever collect more seeds, if it's like, you know, in an island, like an oak tree in the island where it's all falling into a pavement or something, that's when we, when we might collect more seed. You never want to collect a lot from the same places. You want to try to get from different places so you have better genetic diversity. And I like to keep records also when I go and collect of the other species that are that are present because for example you might you know in five years you might want to collect another plant from there and you'll be like oh yeah it's over at this prairie or at this alvar or somewhere. You want to collect from lots of different plants in that population so you collect from ones that are are smaller larger because the more diversity you have in collecting, the, the better the uh, genetics are. And that way, if you get diseases, insects, you have a better chance of, uh, you know, as opposed to just plus tree seed collecting or plus collecting where it's like, this is big, this is beautiful. You want to get from a, a various amount of different plants. So once you've collected those, I take out a, a bag. I have like a belt and a bucket and the bucket goes, you know, around the belt and then you can pull and put your seeds in there. And then, you know, but before you do that, you wanna make sure you're collecting seeds that are good. So you wanna check for seed viability. So what I have in my backpack is I have a magnifying lens for the super small seeds and a knife. So what I'll do is I'll take the seed and cut it open and make sure that it's got good endosperm in it. So the, the white, good white stuff, it's not got air holes in it, there's no damage from bugs and those certain things. If the seed checks out, I check a bunch of them and they're good. Then I'll, I'll go on and collect them. Um, and there's other ways to check. When you get back, you can float the seed. So for example, acorns that are bad float and acorns that are good sink. Another way you can do is you can crop forecast. For example, if you're driving by and you see a stand of white oaks in, you know, let's say June or August, you can see that they're starting to form acorns. I mean, even though they start the year before, but red oaks, any of those sorts of things, you can see what the tree is producing. So you know to come back in September to collect your, your seeds. For cones, I like to cut them open, you know, a month before I collect because sometimes there won't be any, um, any seeds in those cones. There will be poor seeds. As you can see by the slide, you know, that cone's only got like four good seeds in it. So it's always good to do. Some seeds so minute that you can't even see it like a cardinal flower. So sometimes you'll have to take them back and look at them under a microscope or just throw them in your refrigerator and hope that they germinate in the spring. So now we're gonna talk about seed cleaning. So now we, we've collected the seed we want. I like to, if for some reason the seed's a little bit moist, when I go out into the wild, whether it rained the day before, because sometimes you can't predict those things, I like to lay them out on these seed dryers I have, and you can just mimic that at home by using a, a baking sheet and just putting a bunch of uh, pieces of paper towel on it and leave your seed on there because most dry seed, you, you want to let it dry out. So we'll talk about the cleaning of dry seeds and dry seeds are about 70% of the seeds I collect are dry seeds. There's berries and other things that we'll get into later on in this speech. I love the Japanese soil sips. They're great for cleaning seed. Um, I go to the to Dollarama, various stores, and get all sorts of various size mesh of the of of these um, sieves. And what you do is you'll first take your seed and you can put it into a paint bucket that you have here or a coffee container, something good, and um, you put a lid on it and you just shake, shake, shake the seed, and then you turn it upside down on your soil sieve, and uh, the seeds will fall out into a bowl. And that's how you collect it. You, then you'll shake the seeds again until nothing comes out. And then after that happens, sometimes you'll notice that you'll get chafe that goes through with the seed. And if you want really clean, clean seeds, 
you can actually take two bowls, go outside when there's a light wind and, and pour one bowl to the other bowl and that the wind will blow away the, the chafe, but keep the hard seeds will fall. And I have to do that with New Jersey tea and stuff because the, the seed, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, husk of the uh, seed will, is almost the same size. And what we have is a paint mixer. I have a four paint mixer thing in the garage and I just put four species in at once and it shakes it up. Or I put on some bad music and get my kids to dance around and shake the uh, seeds like a seed for me and then promise them a couple of dollars. But they're, uh, they're starting to think they should be paid more. So fruit is about 10 to 15% of what I grow. You know, your choke cherries, your spice bush, um, you know, there's raspberries, you know, the list goes on. I haven't really in this talk spoke about specific um, species, but um, during my time when I'm not so busy in, you know, July, if anybody wants, they can email me and I'll send them like a spreadsheet I have with various different species of Ontario and, you know, the lengths of times and things, how you would, would go about looking after them. So with cleaning fruits, there's a few ways to do it. Um, you can take a blender and you want to put some sort of tape around the blades of the blender. You can put your fresh seed in the blender and just pulse it, pulse it, pulse it. It'll macerate the, um, the pulp and then the seeds will fall to the bottom and you can pour off all the, the pulp and then put it into a sieve for the smaller pulp that settles on the bottom and then just keep shaking it out. And that's how you can clean fruit in some regards. Some fruit like the spice bush, if you were to put it into the blender, it would break the seed coat. It's got a very soft seed coat. So what I do with spice bush is I leave it in a bag for anywhere from three weeks to six weeks till the fruit rots, it stinks really bad. So I keep everything out in my garage because you know, either that or I'd be getting divorced because some of the stuff I have just stinks and uh, leave it rot and then just put it into a good soil sieve and then pour water over the top and that gets rid of the, uh, the, the rotten pulp and then you have clean seed. And after I've cleaned the seed of, of fruits, um, you don't want fruits to dry out because if they dry out, they'll actually become not viable, but they do benefit from 24 hours to 48 hours of sitting on a drying rack and that allows things to dry out. And then once that's done, you'll, we'll put them in moist cold stratification, which is what I'm gonna talk about in a bit, a bit later. I'm just kind of going through the, the steps and sequence. So how I normally would start from collecting to all the way to, to finishing growing. So with native plants, um, anywhere in temperate zones, there's a, a, a dynamic between um, dormant, which is called abscisic acid, which keeps the seed from germinating. So I remember my first time in chemistry seeing these molecules and uh, it was, uh, I, I, I was doomed. I was doomed. I was I did very poorly at chemistry. So I just put that up there to remind me why. And I remember my chemistry teacher said to me, he's like, biologists are weak scientists. He's like, us chemists are real scientists. And I uh, always, uh, and I believe him after taking that course. So basically you have the, this abscisic acid. And what happens as it breaks down over the period of, of cold moist stratification over the winter, it becomes cytokinins. And the cytokinins help break dormancy, and then the plant can actually germinate. So gibberellic acid, which is a cytokinin, um, promotes germination. It also promotes stem elongation. So things like um, which you have here, the uh, a sweet fern, they say, I've never grown it before, but they say that if you add gibberellic acid that you can buy as a powder to the, to the sweet fern seed, that'll actually promote it to germinate. And I'd really like to try it since that, it's a really nice plant. But from what I heard from other people that grow it, they just cut, do cuttings from roots from it. So this is the slide I'm going to concentrate on the most because 70 to 80% of all the plants I grow are cold moist stratified. And um, so basically cold moist stratification is I take the seed after I've let it dry out for a bit, whether it be a berry, whether it be an acorn, whether it be foxglove, beer tongue, cardinal flower, whatever, we want to put it into the refrigerator or somewhere that's between one to four degrees for the winter. And it could be up to four to 20 weeks. So what we do is we take that seed, we write on the bag. This is, you know, wood lily, for example, 
it was collected on this day, it was cold moist stratified this day, and then we put it into about 75% either perlite, vermiculite. You want to have a medium that is sterile because if you have things like fungus or if you go out and use your, your soil from your garden or whatever, you can end up with a lot of nasty things that'll attack your seed. And then you went to all that work and you go into the spring, you pull out a bag of seed that's rotten. So I put 75% perlite or vermiculite in there and then the rest of the seed and I make sure it's mixed evenly. So I'm trying my best so the seeds don't touch. So if we have a seed that rots, it'll, it'll take longer for the other seeds to rot within the bag. So you also wanna have not too much moisture in there, but not too little moisture. You have to have enough moisture that the seed can imbibe with, with water. So it can take it in to start that process of overcoming dormancy. And um, so you want to have it. So if you take it, you have just a nice cast of that soil. If it's too dry, it won't work. If it's too wet, it could rot. So you got to have that fine line. So this is how we do most of the species. And uh, I just want to make sure that this is the big take home slide tonight because that's how, how most species are done. Now we're going to talk about warm moist stratification. So this is a Michigan lily. The Canada lily does the same. And if you read the literature, it also says the wood lily does the same. But um, the wood lily is actually just regular cold moist stratification. So with warm moist stratification, you want to collect the seed, put it in your perlite or vermiculite for about anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. The Michigan lilies will form tiny little bulblets, and then you put them into a period of cold moist stratification. So as I said, I did the wood lilies that way and they all of a sudden germinated in the bag and I had all this, these dead, eventually they died because once I put them in the refrigerator, they just rotted over the winter. So I learned that they're just the standard. You put them in for 60 days. If you put a wood lily for longer than 60 days, they usually start to germinate in the bag. So that's how you do, you know, your Michigan lilies, your Canada lilies, and a bunch of other different plants as well, warm, moist. So there's a bunch of different species that are double or more dormancy, which means that they could go through, you know, two years of cycling through warm, moist, cold, moist, warm, moist, cold, moist. And that's things like a trillium, trillium, you, you collect the seed, it takes about five years before they bloom, two years they, 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 till they germinate, then they come up as a little grass, the next year they might be a grass or have their first three leaves, and it's a slow process. Same with the baneberry. Bladder nuts, another one that takes two, three years to germinate. Same with viburnums, can take two to three years. So those are long. So what I'll do is I'll keep them in my refrigerator and then I'll take them out so they're warm and then I'll put them back and I'll keep cycling through. I've, I, occasionally something might germinate before and that's why you wanna look at your seeds quite often. So scarification. So this is basically the legumes uh, New Jersey teas, we'll talk a little bit about these um, right now that uh, scarification plants don't have the same abscisic acid, um, cytokine and things. They just have a super hard impermeable seed coat. It's really neat. The lupins in the, in, they found lupin seed in the Arctic that were 10,000 years old and they were able to germinate those just because nothing, they were frozen, nothing was able to uh, break that seed coat down. So how I scarify my legumes is I take a mason jar, put sandpaper on the inside of it. So the sandpaper's going into the inside of the jar. I put my lupin, my, you know, my uh, can of milk fetch, um, any sorts of legume seed in that jar. And I shake it up till it looks like the number fifth seed there where you've got a good abrasion on the seed coat. Then I take them and I put them in a big bowl with uh, warm water and leave them soaked for 24 to 48 hours, you'll start to see them swell up and then you plant them out into your plugs, your pots, however you want to grow them. And so that's a really good way to, to grow legumes. Now, some people will use sulfuric acid on some of these plants that uh, have super hard impermeable seed coats. And when you look that up, you wanna know how much sulfuric, what the percentage of it is, you can use that for, um, for lupins and, and other things like maybe uh, basswoods and stuff that are, are hard to germinate that have that really super hard seed coat. I have never used sulfuric acid, but I know some of my colleagues like to use it. So 
I thought I would mention that as a possible thing for seeds that you just can't get to grow that need have that super hard seed coat. Now boiling water. Now this is, you know, I remember the first time 20 years ago pouring super hot boiling water on New Jersey cheese thinking they are absolutely dead. And uh, not at all. That's a great way to germinate them. I've read for New Jersey tea, you can actually go collect ash from your fireplace, mix it in water because there's uh, chemicals in there that will cue germination that they think there's been a fire or you can simply boil your kettle and pour them on there. So that's what I do. I pour them on the uh, New Jersey tea seeds, the narrow leaf and the regular New Jersey tea, the Americanus. And uh, I leave them soak in that boiling water for 24 to 48 hours. Then I sow them and um, it, it's great germination. I also do that with uh, sumax, sumax, the boiling water. I also do boiling water for the uh, Kentucky coffee tree, which is, uh, which is in the, uh, which has a super hard seed coat. I mean, you could also sand the coffee tree, but it's much easier to just pour boiling water on. And uh, it's amazing how well it works. There's also the water soak. So some plants, for the example of buffalo berry, Shepherdia, uh, I collected it the first time and uh, I just moist cold stratified it and it didn't germinate very well. And I started delving through the literature and it said it to give it a warm water soak, you know, for about 24 to 48 hours. And then the germination went up from, you know, like 10 or 30% to like 50%, 60%. So much better. So I do that with the uh, buffalo berry and Eastern Wahoo or the native burning bush. And uh, you can also, the showy tick truffle, which is a legume, you don't actually have to sand them sometimes. If you're lazy and you don't feel like sanding them, you can give them the water soak and you leave them in there for 48 hours, maybe, you know, for four days, then they'll germinate. It's just the water kind of gets into their seed coat and helps them along. So that's another way to, to do some legumes too, is just by a simple, you know, warm water soak. And maybe you could pour boiling <laughs> water on some of these plants. I have no idea. So Sparge, I remember uh, when I met my wife, she, uh, she was uh, angry because she'd come over to my house and I had, you know, gross seeds all in my refrigerator and beer. So now I actually have a cold cellar for my seeds. This isn't my cold cellar. That looks more like a dungeon, but this was a, a picture we got. So I have a cold cellar and when all my, I put my dry seed in there, I put everything's in zip, Ziploc bags that are, that are labeled. And I like Ziplocs because if your basement gets humid, or dry the Ziplocs. Once you put your seed in there, they stay at the moisture content that you wanted them. You can put a filing system in and do it on scientific or just on regular, you know, the common names, whatever works for you. Um, so it doesn't matter the humidity necessarily. It's better to have somewhere drier, but as I said, I just use Ziploc bags. So they, they kind of work on keeping things at an even consistency. Because some seeds, I've had some New Jersey tea seeds that are 15, you know, 15, 16 years old that still germinate. I just keep them dry in a Ziploc bag. Same with lupins. I've had some lupins for 15 years and they come up great every year. So if you've got a really good year where there's lots of New Jersey teas, you can collect enough to last you for three, four or five years, depending on how many you'd like to grow for yourself. So seed maintenance is really important. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, I didn't do the, the first year I was in business. I just threw everything in my refrigerator and pulled stuff out, you know, in the spring when I was ready to sow it. And I had lost a few species to rot. So, you know, why I like to check is sometimes the, the, it's too moist in the bag. You thought you had a good cast or whatever you thought, that, but you see it from the condensation, the bags, it was too moist. So you can rectify that if it's too moist, just put more perlite in there or something to dilute that to take up some of the moisture. It could be too dry, there'd be nothing in there. So you could take a water bottle or a spritzer and spritz a bit of water until you get that right moisture content. So that's a, a good way to check. And if seeds rot in them, we can do other things. We have rotten seed. What you can do is uh, take the seed out of the bag leave it on the dryer, even with the perlite, put it out and then spray it with hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide works really well, but you don't wanna do it full strength. It might be okay because they're just seed, but I haven't. I, I usually use 50 milliliters per liter of hydrogen peroxide and spray that on my seeds. And then, and that will help 
you know, sometimes they're just too far gone, but if, if you get them right away, you can use hydrogen peroxide or garden sulfur is another thing to pour it out. Garden sulfur smells really bad, hydrogen peroxide not as bad. So I prefer hydrogen peroxide, but sulfur works really well too. So two important things, I think, if you're gonna, if you're gonna spend all that time to get them that far to take a look in your refrigerator. Here's three species that seeds that rot almost no matter what when they're put in moist cold stratification. So what I do with these species, the wall blue flocks, the eastern wahoo, the baneberries, is I actually direct sow them. So in the fall, after the berries are cleaned on the uh, wahoo or on the baneberries, I sow them into seed flats and, uh, and then put them outside and just let them cycle through till they come up. And with the baneberry, it could be, it'll be two years usually before they come up. And the wahoo, it'll usually come up the, after the, the winter. The thing is, they seem to rot no matter what I do, and no matter even if I put use less uh, water in there for some reason, and the flocks too. The only thing is that you want to watch out for is sometimes rodents really like to eat seeds. So I put hardware cloth, which is like chicken wire, but it's super fine mesh, and I put that over them and weight it down so that rodents and stuff can't get at the seeds. Now, I love grasses because they're really easy. You pull the grass heads off, and let them dry out till they're at the right humidity you want, and you just store them dry. And you pull them out when you're ready for them, and you sow them. So you, do, you don't have to do moist cold stratification on them. I found I used to because I'd read that they benefited from it, but I found that they, they uh, didn't do any better, and sometimes they'd actually rot. So if I kept them dry, they wouldn't rot. I sow them, and they come up well. So that's, uh, you know, if, if you have stratified them in the past, just skip the step, then you don't have to worry about rot or, or doing that extra kind of work. Now sedges, Ryan's favorite plant here. Um, I couldn't sell these when I started, you know, at all. No one wanted sedges. I'm really happy that people are buying sedges now because they're a great, great little plant. They, they just, they look really nice and they're, they're very cool, but they need a period of moist cold stratification, usually 60, 90 days. And, uh, and they come up very well. I mean, I have, there's so many different sedges in Ontario, but they, you know, the 10 or 15 I grow consistently, they do really well just through just a, a basic period of uh, moist cold stratification. So willow, willow and poplar germination. I gave this its own slide because uh, they're interesting. So they're seeds only viable for anywhere from a week to two um, from what I've, I've heard. What we do is we pick them off the ground when they blow off these the, the, the little seed heads. And then you take the little fluffs, they're super tiny, and put them onto to moist uh, uh, soil or, or you know your potting mix, and then they germinate right away. And so if you leave them, they, uh, they lose their viability. So they're no, they're no good anymore. So they're, uh, a lot of the time too, another way I get them is they, they become a weed at my nursery because we have so many poplars and willows on the pop property when we're weeding, we just take a big bucket out with us and throw all the weeded poplars and willows and sort through them and, and then put them into their respective uh, pots. So white oaks, uh, I thought I'd talk about them separately as well, because when you collect them, they actually put the radical down right in the fall. So putting them in a bag with, with peat, you can break the radical. So what I do is I get a big, huge tubber a big a rubber made container and I do lasagna style where I put a uh, soil down and I put the, the lay all the white oak group acorns like bur oaks, chinkapins, whatever kind I'm growing, swamp white oaks. And then I put more soil over top, another layer, another layer and another layer. And then in the spring, I carefully tease them out and plant them into either a gallon pod or, or a deep plug because they have a deep tap root. And, um, and then that's how, how I do them. If they don't have a period of moist cold stratification, they'll never put up their shoot. So you, you have to put them into your cellar or somewhere cold for the winter. I've never had them freeze. So perhaps they could be left outside um, as long as rodents can't get at them. The thing is when you plant your acorns out in the spring, you wanna put them in a cage because lots of stuff likes to eat acorns. They grow slow and everything likes to eat them. So appreciate a two foot tall oak tree that someone sells you. 
here's some hard to grow species ones that like i don't get it you know I, i've tried these for years you, you collect basswoods and uh, they can take up to six seven eight years before they germinate sometimes they never will a lot of the times uh same with blue co or so you just come up when they want to come up um so it's really neat i mentioned these two because i've been told by other growers that if someone could could figure out how to grow basswoods consistently and reliably you could have a whole nursery by just selling basswoods so you know they're they're no fun to grow same with the blue cohosh so that's why some years i have them and some years i don't so we're going to talk about fern propagation ryan's telling me i got 10 minutes left here so i'll, I'll uh, i'm gonna skip on the the building a native plant garden which is uh just was, i just added in case i was uh, talking too fast tonight ferns are really neat very easy to grow so that's uh you collect them in the fall from their their uh, fertile frond um some of them have sorry which is their spore producing bodies on the underside of the leaves and some have like an ostrich fern or a sensitive fern, you know, uh, this was just a, a, a leaf that's just basically spores on it. So you collect them when they've gone brown and dry, you take a brown paper bag, you take the fern, shake them up, and then you have all the little tiny brown like dust. And what you want to do is take an open flat, not a plug tray, but an open flat like you see on the screen there with the humidome. That's important, they have to be humid. Put the spores out on and what happens is they form gametophytes and believe it or not the uh, the sperm swims from one gametophyte to the other gametophyte and the fertilization actually happens as the gametophytes and not at the plants so you'll see that all of a sudden a little tiny once they've reproduced a little fernlet will come up and you can have a, a fern that's big enough for your garden in about two years so they're really cool not pretty easy to grow and they'll grow through the winter if you do that you can put them under grow lights grow them and for some reason they'll just keep growing through the summer till it gets cold so i'm going to talk just really briefly orchids are almost impossible to grow unless you have the right conditions um when i was at trent we did an orchid tissue culture lab and did stuff in the flow head and the reason i'm putting the slide out there is i would really like to see some people do this so you, you know you have Orchid seeds are, are super tiny. They have hardly any um, endosperm in them. And what happens is in the wild, a fungus comes up to the seed to eat the seed, like a species of like rhizobium. And actually the orchid seed actually eats the, the, uh, the um, pelotons from the uh, fungus and uses that as a surrogate source of energy for sugars and stuff. So that is almost impossible to mimic. So what they've done is they take what's called an agar plate. They put sugars in there and um, different nutrients. And they put these, they bleach the orchid seed for anywhere from like 10 minutes to five hours and then put them into a flow hood. So in the laminar flow hood makes sure there's no bacteria or fungal spores. So it's just pure orchid culture. You put them in there. If it's a cypridium, like a lady slipper, it'll germinate and grow without light for about you know two years, a year, and then you can pot them in a pot and then they'll put out a stem. And I, if anybody's interested in growing orchids, I would definitely share my knowledge with them um, because I'd really like to see, I just don't have the time, but I'd really like to see some, some, some orchids grown, especially the yellow lady slippers, which is a super easy orchid to grow in your garden. So another good method to get, to get uh, extra plants is simply cuttings. For example, if you want poplar, you missed a, uh, out on the, the window of collecting poplar seed, you can you know use eastern cottonwood and uh, balsam poplar really well from cuttings. Um, for things like trembling aspen and a large tooth aspen will not. A lot of willows too will do well from cuttings. Most of your mints will do well from cuttings. I just cut the mints if I need more, let's say uh, Oswago tea um, before they bloom, it, even though you can do cuttings when they bloom, but they just make a better crown for the winter. Red Osier dogwoods and different dogwoods you can do too. It's better to do it at different times of the year though. So now we're gonna talk about sowing seeds. So now we've gone over all the different, you know, ways to collect and look at these things. And now it's time to, to pull out. We've done all this work and we're gonna go sow them. So I always use a sterilized potting mix. I know some people like to use sand and stuff. It's heavy, 
it's got bugs and stuff. So I use like a nice loose, light, sterilized potting mix. And just most of the seed, if it's really tiny, I sow it on the surface because it needs light to cue the germination. If it's an acorn, I'll plant the acorn just about the depth of the actual acorn. And, um, and that's, uh, so you put them on, on you make, put your potting mix into a flat and then you sow, sow your seed on there and you need light. So once you put it in your greenhouse, your windowsill, outside, whatever you want, you'll have germination. Once you've, uh, you've had germination, you want to focus on um, watering. And uh, I find that with seedlings, you don't want to water them too much because they'll, they can get things like damp off and different fungal diseases. So I like to water them in the morning so the sun hits them and dries them out quickly, at least around the stems. You don't want to sow them too thick either because that makes it so air movement can't get through. So you only want to water when needed. Don't sow too many seeds um, that everything's going to crowd themselves, that you're going to be able to take them out and uh, water deeply and thoroughly and not often. I mean, watering is one of the most important things at, at a nursery, watering and fertilizer, that you get those different things right. I don't fertilize my plants till about two weeks after they germinate um, because they're a bit sensitive. But because you're growing them in pots, the area is finite, so they run out of nutrients quick. You have to fertilize, whether it be you know, a slow-released organic or, or uh, just a regular, fast, mixable, soluble fertilizer. So damping off is a, a, a big problem, and that's uh, where you get this fungus that attacks the crown of the plant between the roots and the shoot, and it kills them. That's like the area of your plant that you don't want to die. Um, when, when we were at Trent, we used to use no damp. It smelled bad and uh, it works good, but I prefer to use hydrogen peroxide. It works great. And that's 30 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. I water all my seedlings with hydrogen peroxide each week at 30 milliliters per liter. And it really gets rid of damp off. It also gets rid of cyanobacteria and different algaes that are growing on the surface of the uh, soil. So let's talk about fertilizer. Um, I find if it's frozen, really poor soils and uh, or alvars and stuff, you don't want something with high nitrogen. So I'll use something like a 10, 15, 10. And I will only, let's say, use it at about a third to a half of the strength. If they're little plants, maybe even a quarter of the strength, then up to a third. A lot of our plants, you know, don't enjoy a lot of nutrients. So if you give them too much, uh, they can get fertilizer burn, or they can get too much of, of, of other. I have a book called The Horse Martian and Mineral Nutrition of Plants, and it's great. It's got a whole table where you can look at the color of your plants. Is it it's missing this nutrient? Um, does it have too much of this nutrient? And it's very good. Things like wetland plants and your stuff that grows in ditches and more, I'll use something with a higher nitrogen level. So... Fertilizing is very important. And you can use slow release fertilizers too. I use both at the nursery. Um, in case I forget to fertilize one week, I've got a bit of slow release because you know within a, a month, if you know your plants can start to get look bad if, if they're not looked after. So now we're just gonna I got two minutes left, so we're not gonna do this little section um, just because you guys were guinea pigs. So this was the first time I really did this speech. So I wasn't sure if I was gonna make the time or not. But uh, I think we're just going to have a uh, question and answer period. And um, yeah, thank you for listening to me lab on. Cool, cool. OK, thanks so much, Paul. That was uh, really awesome. OK, we did have a lot of questions, so we can spend a good amount of time with questions. Although I have to say, like, shucks, I kind of want to see those other, <laughs> those other <laughs> slides. But, you know, OK, no, let's respect the, uh, the questions. And I'm glad you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Um, that I wrote down the questions because it's hard to find them. <laughs> um, one question, very pertinent, um, was about the recording of this uh, this particular thing that's happening and will it be um, posted? And so Ali, I think, is going to uh, put the link up in the chat again. It's namps.org um, and it will be available within the next week, um, just so everybody knows. Okay, the first question that came in was from Megan and it was about... Um, seeds with fluff like pappas on them like ironweed um mm -hmm. and like tough pappas and um yeah megan wanted to know what you do about that pappas how do you get that off you can get it off but i don't it doesn't bother me 
So I still get the same germination. It doesn't um, really, it doesn't make the seeds rot any quicker, but to get rid of the pappus, if you want to, is you take a screen and you just rub the aster seeds over the screen and then the seeds will fall through and the pappus gets stuck in the screen. And that's how you do it. But I found that it would take me a long time to do that where I didn't get any cost benefit. It was just easier for me to throw the aster seed in with the pappus. Got it. All right, there you go, Megan. Um, okay, Colin had a good question um, about when you're um, stratifying really small seeds and then they're done stratifying, how do you separate them from the stratifying medium or do you? You don't, no. And that's why I like to use perlite or vermiculite so I can see the seeds. Plus, if you mix it at that right ratio, you know about how much you're gonna plant because that's a great question because like certain seeds like cardinal flower just so, or monkey flower are, are tiny. But if you use perlite or vermiculite, you'll still see and you know kind of how much you're gonna wanna put in. Like I like to sow anywhere from two to four seeds per plug if it's something small, because you know you might not have a 60% you know, viability of those seeds. So, but again, you don't want crowding because that's what causes damp off. Correct, okay, okay. So I'm gonna link that one. There were actually a couple of people who had a question about this perlite vermiculite thing. So Donna amongst others were asking um, if you, Sounds like you really prefer this method with the perlite, but some people were saying about, um, can they use damp paper towel in the plastic bag? Um, others were talking about paper bags. Do you prefer paper versus plastic? Or, or uh, yeah, basically, do you have alternatives to the perlite in plastic bag method? The reason I like that the plastic bag is because it keeps the same humidity. Like if you were to put the, it in, in a paper bag and it's moist, it'll just, the, the paper bag will rot and cause your seed to rot. Um, if you're storing grass seeds or stuff in paper bags, it's gonna take on the humidity of whatever's in the room. I like to keep paper bags sometimes because, you know, you're, you're, it's gonna help it dry out. But as far as storing them, you really wanna keep that humidity. And if it's, you're bothered because you're using plastic bags, you could all, you know, reuse those bags. When you're done sowing the seed, you could wash the bags out and be like, this is, you know, scratch out or that whatever the date is and change the date and use that bag again for New England asters. Or you could go get Rubbermaid containers and use those. But you want to have something that's going to keep the humidity equalized because that's a problem if your plants are getting too dry or too wet, depending on where you're putting them. All right. Okay. There's your answer, all you stratification container people. <laughs> um, Alyssa had a question about, um, okay, so if we have seeds that need scarification, but we're gonna do a winter sow instead of a, a spring stratification kind of indoor situation, would you still scarify if you're just gonna sow them outside uh, or are they gonna do that themselves? Uh, I, if I'm gonna just sow them out, you wanna scarify them. Like if it's a legume, right? Because that's what it is. It's the impenetrable seed coat. If they if they're outside, maybe they, you know, maybe the freezing and thawing might help abide their seed coat too. But usually what I do with the, the legumes is I just sand them and then put them in water for 24 hours and then sow them right in the spring. But if you want to put them out in the fall, that would be too. The problem with a lot of legume seeds is that they the rodents love them. Like they would, they eat the, so you want to put hardware cloth over. So to me, it's just easier to, to sow them in my greenhouse in the spring, or at least if she does that, put some sort of protection over the, uh, the, the uh, flat, the seed flat. Mm. Okay. So that relates. Uh, we had another question from Doug about your hardware cloth or hardware mesh. Um, it's a very basic, simple question. What's the, uh, the pore size on that? Was it a quarter inch, half inch? Do you remember? Oh, you want it as small as you can get it. Small as you like can it's get it. Tiny. It's like maybe like an eighth of an inch. It's almost just a bit bigger than the, the size of a common um, kitchen sieve, right? Because those rodents are really, you know, get their, their you know, noses in there and eat, and eat your seed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, another question 
super cool question actually from Sydney uh, Campbell. Thank you for this question. Um, what would you recommend for those who want to start a small native plant nursery or to grow um, as, a, as a small grower? What's your recommendation to folks? Um, yeah, just uh, it's great. I think there's uh, enough work out there that more people can definitely grow plants. Um, advice I would give is, is start off small. I mean, I was given this advice from Paul Richardson's from Richardson's Pine Needle Farm. He said to me, don't get too crazy too quick. And uh, so I kept it all manageable. I, I, I grew plants that were fairly easy to grow. And, um, and, you know, and I had a lot of help from Mary Gartshore and stuff too, from other people. So I think it's great. Like, you know, we're, we're all good to each other. And if, if you're starting, definitely ask people that are in the know or, or get yourself some good books on it. And, uh, and I think there's room for more growers. Definitely. It's a, it's a fun job. I'm kind of getting sick of it after 23 years. So looking for someone to take over my, uh, so I can retire. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. We need more growers for sure. That's really cool. Okay. I've got a super specific and nerdy one for you. There's, there's a bunch of questions in here about specific plants that I can pull up for you, Paul, but some of them are plants that are not native to Ontario. They're like native to outside in other provinces and, and territories and whatnot. Um, but this one, I think you'll get, cause it's about turtle head. Okay. Um, so turtle head, um, did this person and did a cold uh, moist strat for two months planted no action after three weeks and they're asking um, can they return the seeds to do another round of cold strat or what do you recommend here yeah I do my turtle head for about 90 to 120 days um, they may need less I, I haven't actually done the you know the exact time um, but sometimes you can get bad seed from turtle head and it just won't come up so that's when you really want to check your seed viability and they're not too bad. You can cut them in the field and actually see with your naked eye if the turtle heads are good. So that might be one thing, but she can definitely put them back in for more uh, moist cold stratification and try them later and see if that'll snap them out. But what I would do if I was her is I would uh, cut them, take a bunch and cut them and make sure that there's actually viable seed. They also could have rotted over the thing. You might not notice, but their things could be mush inside as well. So make sure they're firm and plump. All right, there you go. And about the uh, turtle head. Um, okay, so Calix here has asked, and I'm actually curious about this too. I might use a uh, facilitator privilege here. If it's possible for you to maybe in the next three minutes, like quickly go through the slides that you put together for the build a native garden or seed bed. Was that possible or is it like too, too yeah, much? Yeah, to I, I can, as long as I just didn't want to go over my time. I mean, you no, guys I think, got stuff to do, right? Well, there's still 295 people in the, in the room. I think they would not mind seeing it even in a condensed form. Okay, let's do it. Okay. All right. So, so now that we've actually got our plants to germinate, what are we going to do with them? We want to outplant them. And I think, uh, you know, a seed bed is a great place because if you build a seed bed, you can collect your seed from there. So you can stop putting any pressure on any of the wild populations. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways you can do it, but I like the lasagna gardening method, um, which we'll talk about. So the first thing I do when I'm, I'm going to build a garden or a seed bed is I want to check out what kind of soil I have. That's imperative. I don't want to plant a cardinal flower in dry soil on an upland slope, and I don't want to plant big blue stem in a wet swale at the bottom of a slope in clay. So what you do is you dig from, you'll see the horizons. There's the O horizon, which is your organics. You have more organics that are melanizing with your B, which is your mineral soil, and your C horizon, which are all different textures. Most of your plant's roots are going to be in the A and B horizon. And so I take a mason jar, dig into a bit of the A and the B, shake the, the soil up with water in it in a mason jar, and we'll stratify into the different layers, uh, you know, of the heaviest to, to the lightest soil. And then that way you can make your determination. Okay, I've got most of my soil in here is clay and, um, or more of it's sand. And so that's how you can tell your soil texture. And that'll really help determine what plants are gonna go in what localities. You also want to determine your moisture regime. You know, if you have you know, a, a clay that's got like rust color in it, that's from, you know, the water table going up and the water table going down will cause things to rust, your iron and your soil to rust. 
if it's called a glaisolix clay, which has like a kind of a greenish color, that means it's, it's waterlogged soil again. So that's where you're going to want to plant your, your, your turtle heads or your uh, blue lobelias and stuff like that. If it's pure sand, it's dry, that's where you want to plant your New Jersey teas, your, your lupins and stuff like that. So you really want to just determine your soil. That's, that's going to save you with a lot of trouble. Unless you're in a place where you've got sand and you need seed beds and you can irrigate or whatever. I try to just work with nature and you know, less is more for me. The less I have to weed and irrigate, the happier I am. So preparation for planting. This is the cheapest and easiest way. This is how I do it at my house because I just don't want to dig the turf up. I don't want to do all this. So in the fall, I'll take my lawnmower and basically scurf the yard and then I'll put either I'll put you know either five to ten sheets of newspaper down or two things of cardboard with no um, gaps in because any gaps grass or whatever weeds are going to come up you want to make sure that everything is closed and then you want to put on mulch so here's a picture of a cardboard I got this one for free there's lots of gaps in there so that would be their first layer then you would want to stagger your second layer so there isn't those gaps there because you went to all that trouble and you'll have grass run through there in no time. So in the, in the fall, after I put all my, my cardboard down, I will put six inches of mulch. Um, and uh, that will help kill all the vegetation under it. And then in the spring, you can plant, if it's something like gout weed um, or you've killed something like, you know, gout weed, as I said, you might want to even wait two years before you plant. So mulch, I just want to talk about how much I love mulch. Um, it's great to suppress weeds. The problem, the only problem with mulch, if you have really fresh mulch, it can take some of the nitrogen from the bacteria and fungus decomposing it. So you might want to add like a little tiny bit of slow release fertilizer, or if you've got a super duper rich site, mulch won't do anything. I never add any fertilizer to it, but if you're on somewhere that's nitrogen poor, you might want to add something like that. So after you've uh, mulched it and you've got really nice soil to plant into, weed free if you did if you did a good job of making sure. And uh, here's a garden we built in Bob Cajun. Um, even let us plant golden rods in there, so it's kind it's kind of a nice nice mix. So as you can see. Um, it's a great way to do seed beds or make a garden. So I'm really happy that I was able to do this because we basically talk from collecting to collecting seed again. So there you have like a finished product where you can, instead of going out to the wild to collect seed, you have your own area to collect seed if you have the space kind of thing, if you want to get into this. Well, thank you. And thank you, Paul. That was great. I'm so glad we were able to squeeze in those last couple of slides. There's a, there's a lot in there, folks. Yeah, literally, you could go from... Uh, from collecting all the way to garden here. Um, that was so thorough and comprehensive, so much detailed, specific knowledge that you've accumulated over more than two decades, Paul. It's just such a pleasure to, to hear you. And thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, and well, thanks I to want our... other people to start growing the plants. <laughs> you know, there's, it's gotten so busy for all of us growers, there's room for more, you know? Uh, I'm so glad you, you feel that way. But, uh, you know, a lot of people I think are gonna try this and, and find that you do it much better <laughs> and they should You're all go to grow grow wild and get plants. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a lot of work. They're going to find out that it's a lot of work and your springs aren't. I remember going out on these great nature walks and now it's just work, work, work. My poor kids hate oh me gosh. in the spring. So they're like, where are you? And I'm like, ah, just give me another month. <laughs> they can plant babies. That's, that's amazing. Okay. Well, so thank, thanks again to you. That's, um, uh, that's great. Um, you know, and thanks to our audience as well. We had at our max, we were at 308 native plant nerds. I love that so much. <laughs> um, so thanks to all of you for being really active in the chat. Lots of questions, um, lots of engagement, lots of uh, reconciliation actions up there too. scroll all the way to the top. Um, there were some questions too, Paul, about books. Um, Maybe yeah. if I could if I could bug you to possibly yeah. like type some stuff out and maybe we can send it out in an email blast or That's a newsletter, a idea. something like that would be I would that would be great. I'm sure people would love to know your 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 book list. I'll just quickly tell tell them my favorite couple of books if you can Go just for remember it. William Kalina books. I think they may be out of a print, but he may print them again. 
and he's got their great books. Also, uh, so William Kalina from the New England Wildflower Society, just fantastic books. Michael Durr books, Henry Koch books, and uh, I have to give a plug. Um, there's a gentleman in, um, in, in um, Ridgetown named uh, Rick Bray, and he co-authored it with Sean Booth, who I think owns a, a nursery as well. And it hasn't been published yet, but it's uh, Species in Ontario. So I'm not sure when they're going to get it published. They sent me wow. a copy. I'm reading it right now, and it's absolutely fantastic. Oh, so gosh. I uh, just wanted to give those guys a plug. So when their book comes on the market, I don't remember what it's called, but I will type out a nice email to you that you can share with people with a pile of my resources as i said nothing i talked about tonight i came up with this is all other people's hard research and mm, uh, it's mm. great to share it amazing yes would love to get those records and, and we'll blast it out through the e-news or whatever 